And what have Colossians chapter 1. And what have we been seeing in the book of Colossians? One thing Paul reiterating over and over. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Paul writing to the Colossian church. We're going to go through a little review. It won't take too much time. Colossians chapter 1 verses 3 through 7. Will you look at it with me? Colossians 1, 3 through 7. And that's huge. Because if you was to ask the major religions of today, what is God like? Everybody would have a different answer. Everybody would have a different answer. Some people say, what do you mean, what is God like? Gods, there's millions of gods, hundreds of thousands of gods, right? Hinduism says, right? Other, other religions point to prophets, right? But for a Christian, and according to what this scripture says, when somebody asks you, what is God like? Our answer is Jesus Christ. He is the image, the reflection, the representation of all that God is, the invisible God. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Christ has made him known, that God, known. He's the image of the invisible God. Our answer to what is God's like is Jesus. What is God like is Jesus Christ. It's not Muhammad, Buddha, Hare Krishna, Confucius, not New Age, Pope Francis, who was the vicar of Christ, meaning Christ's representation. No. The Bible points to one person, like we said earlier, this book, 66 books, about one person, the image of the invisible God, Jesus Christ, this son, became flesh, who became flesh. Not even the church. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the reflection of all that God is. You go to him if you want to know God and what God is like. Christ is the image of the invisible God. And it goes on in verse I'm continuing in verse 15. He is the firstborn of all of creation. He is the firstborn of all of creation. Now our Mormon Jehovah Witness neighbors really confuse this one. Because here in our context right here, when you hear the word firstborn, what do you think of, honestly? Hmm? The oldest, right? Or the, or the first one born, right? So when you read Jesus is the firstborn of all of creation, you would think, oh, he was born first before everyone. That's what a lot of people profess to be Christian or similarity, sim similar to what a Christian is, believe about Jesus, that he was the first person created. I was in a prayer meeting once. In the, in the middle of a prayer meeting, God called out and said, guys, why are you proclaiming Jesus as if he wasn't a created being? He was a created being. That was an awkward prayer meeting, but we had to, we had to rebuke that because it's a lie. Firstborn sometimes can mean the one who was born first. It can sometimes mean the one who was born first. But not in this context, okay? It does not mean the one who was born first in this context. This, when it says Christ is the firstborn of all creation, it's talking about his authority, his preexistence, his preeminence, his authority. He's the firstborn of all creation. The word firstborn, I'm going to say this in the Greek, is prototokos, okay? Prototokos is the word firstborn. And it, signif it signifies priority. Christ is the one with priority, in the culture, in culture, right, now, those of the Colossian church will be understanding this. In, in the culture of the ancient Near East, the firstborn was not necessarily the oldest child. King David in the Bible was called the firstborn. He was not the first one born in his family. It was talking about his kingship and his authority, his rank. Not the birth order, but his rank. The firstborn possessed the inheritance and leadership. The inheritance, when meaning when in, in a family context, right? When father dies, the firstborn gets the inheritance, the, the authority. Right? So when it says Christ is the firstborn, meaning the authority, meaning kingship belongs to him, the heir, the firstborn of all of creation, the authority, the king, the heir of all of creation, that means he rules all of creation. He is the ruler of all of creation. The phrase firstborn of all creation literally proclaims Christ preeminent. He is Lord over all of creation. He runs it. He runs the show. He's the authority of all of creation. He's the firstborn. He is superior over all others, meaning all other gods, all other people, all other created things. He is above it all. He's the preeminent one. He is the firstborn of all creation. He is Lord. And this is emphasized in the next few verses. 
We can see in context, this is emphasized in the next few verses. The next few verses do not point to a man who was born before everybody, okay? It points to a man of authority, of authority, the God of authority, the Son of God. Listen to the next verse in verse 16. So he, this Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, is the image, reflection of the invisible God, the firstborn, meaning ruler and authority of all of creation, for by him, by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers and authorities. All things were created by, uh, through him and for him. Do you hear that? I'm going to read that again. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers and authorities, all things were created through him. All things were created by Jesus. Jesus is the ruler of all creation, the firstborn, the authority, the preeminent one, and he is also the creator. That means, to make it practical for you guys, the sky, when you go walking outside, that sky above you, Psalm 16, that says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim his handiwork. They scream out, God, God, God. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. The heavens that declare the glories of God, Jesus created it. There are enough stars for each and every one of us to have 11 trillion of them. That's just a fact. Each and every one of us to have 11 trillion of them. Jesus Christ knows each and every one of them by name. The roaring seas that we think are so terribly big, Christ is the word that spoke them into being. He is the preeminent one. He is the authority and ruler of all creation. For by, by him, all things were created. To every galaxy and planet that is in the solar system, to every ant that walks the ground, it was created by Jesus, okay? Do you see? That's more than some prophet, some prophet that came to, to show us how to do good things. There are some Christians, professing Christians that believe that, that Jesus was just a good teacher, or he came to be an example of how to, how to die on the cross and show himself to be loving to the world. No, no, that's not what the scriptures say. He's the authority of all of creation, and he's the creator of all of creation. To every ant that walks on the ground, it was created by Jesus. To make it personal, listen guys, look at me. To make it personal, you were created by Jesus. You were created by Jesus. Jesus spoke you into being. The reason you're standing or sitting here today, the reason I'm standing here, and the reason you're sitting here today is because the ground beneath you was created by Jesus. And you're here today because Jesus wants you to be here today. You were created by him. And let's look at what it says. It says, verse 16, all things. What's the definition of all? <laughs> Everything. Everything. And then it goes on to, to, to name those things, okay? For by him all things were created in heaven. In heaven. In heaven. That's the heavenly realms where we cannot see. That's where God dwells, created by and through Jesus. By and through Jesus, okay? All things in heaven where God dwells. And the heavens, right, that declare the glory of God. The skies that proclaim his handiwork created by and through Jesus. He's the preeminent one. All things on earth, right? It says in verse 16, in heaven and on earth, okay? The ground beneath you, the sky above you, every sip of Gatorade that you take on a cool, hot summer day created by Jesus in his mercy. Created by Jesus. Everything on earth, every molecule on this planet, created by Jesus. And then it says, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. I want to show you guys a picture. How many of you have ever seen this picture? Facebook, Instagram, ever seen that picture? Okay. What does it represent? What does this picture typically represent? Okay. The battle, the battle of between evil and good, right? You see, these, you see these concepts in the movie, right? Evil 
evil is getting a foothold, right? We just seen uh, what it was, Avengers, the Endgame, right? An evil, okay? That's what that's what this picture represents. Jesus supposedly is the good one, and Satan, the evil one. I'm gonna make the case as blasphemy. It's blasphemy. I'm gonna tell you why. You're gonna make that case. I'm gonna tell you why. Listen to what the text says. For by him, professing him, by him, by Jesus, all things were created. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers and authorities, Satan was created by Jesus, okay? It's not the kingdom of darkness versus the, the, the kingdom of light, and, and sometimes darkness is... It is getting a foothold on, on the light and sometimes the no, 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 no. Satan was created by Christ. Jesus owns Satan. Satan had no, has no claim over Jesus. There was not a single moment on this planet, even when Christ was bleeding out his last drop of blood, screaming, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It wasn't a single moment on this planet where Satan had a claim over Jesus. You see that in John chapter 4. John, uh, in, the, in, the, in the final moments that Jesus had with his disciples in John chapters 14 through 17, he told them, he has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me. Right? He laid down his life in accordance with the will of the Father. Okay? Satan has no claim over Jesus, whether thrones or dominions or rulers and authorities. This includes Satan and his demons. That's why when Jesus walked the earth, they were so terribly afraid of him, right? Read the Gospel of Mark. The moment Jesus shows up, oh, son of man, what are, what are you to do with us? Are you here to torture us before the appointed time? Who was there to torture them? The son of man. Satan and his demons had no claim over Christ. They were terrified of him. Because by him, all things were created. All things are, were working through, to, to, to God's eternal plan, even when Christ was on the cross. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and through him. Visible and invisible. Satan, his demons, the war that we cannot see, Ephesians chapter 6 talks about. Dominions or rulers or authorities. We live in a very fearful generation right now, even within the church, right? That's constantly worried about politics. That's how, rather than opening this book and seeing what it says, what God says, we constantly worry about politics and are anxious and are, on the, and, are, and are on the edge of our seats because who's president, who's this, and who's that? God, Jesus is not on the edge of the seat. All things are created by him. And through him, whether thrones or dominions or rulers and authorities, he owns them. He owns, he owns anyone in office. He owns the president. He, he's working all things according to his eternal plan, from the highest of authority to the lowest of authority, from the president of the United States, Donald Trump, to the bacteria between your fingertips, okay? Jesus owns it all, and he created it all. All things were created. He is sovereign over it all. Even his own death on our behalf, doing the will of the Father, sovereign over it all. All things, verse 15 through 16. He is the image, the exact representation. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers and authorities. All things were created through him. But get this. All things were created through him, right? Right? But not just through him. All things were created for him. Not just by Jesus. Not just through Jesus. All things were created for this king, for this son, in whom we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. All things were created. This deals with the purpose of all of creation. The purpose of God of creating the universe, okay? All of creation has one purpose. To glorify Jesus Christ in the redemption or the destruction of sinners. That's what the scriptures say. To glorify Jesus Christ in the redemption or destruction of sinners, which is in the verses later. If you are sitting here breathing and alive today, it's because you're a created being. And you were created by Jesus. And you were also created for Jesus. Okay? You were created for Jesus. The stars that look so amazing at night, right? I keep going back to Psalm 16. The uh, Psalm 19, the heavens that declare 
the glory of God. The skies that proclaim his handiwork created for Jesus. The planets, more personal, to make it more personal, your job, wife, your boyfriend, girlfriend, the lost person, even the lost person we as disciple makers seek to share the gospel with, right? Even the, even the hundreds of, of other gods that are out there, specifically in this community, Clarkston, the hundreds of other gods that are out there, each and every person worshiping the false god, they are created for Jesus. That should change our mindset in evangelism. That should change our mindset in disciple making. They were made for the glory of Christ. Everything on this planet was made for the glory of Christ. Everything you have, everything, things that are not in your possession, your neighbors, everything, everything. You know what that means, guys? You know what that means? Look up here. You were not created for you, okay? That means if all things in heaven and on earth, whether invisible, visible thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities, all things were created by Jesus and for Jesus. You were not created for you. God was not lonely in heaven, so he created you. Like we said, this book is 66 books that consist of one story, okay? The coming death, burial, resurrection, and the coming kingdom of this son, Jesus Christ. One story in this book. And the stories are not about you, okay? It's about God, it's about Jesus. God was not lonely in heaven, so he created you. As many modern preachers say, the triune God, he's the image of the invisible God. That's obviously God the Father. He's the image of him. Right? This triune God is by nature in, itself, in himself self-sufficient. Self-sufficient, meaning, meaning there is a perfect relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Perfectly one together in community, and there's a perfect, they have everything that they need in one another. Meaning when God created you, it was not because he needed you, okay? It was for the glory of his son and the, the outflow of literally his divine nature and character, his mercy. He, out, out of the outflow of his divine nature and character, he created us. Not because he needed you. You need him. <laughs> you need him. You were created for Jesus. You need him. He does not need us. All things were created for him, for Jesus. Not only you, but everything that you have, everything that you own, it belongs to Jesus. It belongs to this son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. They all belong to Christ. Everything that we have belongs to Christ. We constantly say in our gospel presentation, right, in our little three circles, right, we live in this broken world that's, that's full of brokenness if we look around the world today. Okay, and society around us knows that it's broken because what it constantly tries to do is escape it, right? If I get enough drugs, I'm going to satisfy myself in this broken world because I'm empty here. If I get enough, if I get enough, uh, if I find love, I'm going to find myself in another broken person, right? And then we will complete one another, okay? Which is not going to happen. But we will complete one another. Then I'll be satisfied and say all those things are like bungee cords and they keep us in brokenness. It's because you were not created for you or anything else in this world. Or anything else in this world. The broken world and all the things that it seeks to offer you. That's not the purpose of your life. Nor the purpose of any, anything. All things were created by Jesus and for Jesus. Ask the people who are rich. Ask the people, ask these rappers, right? who seemingly have everything that this world has to offer, says them, right? Everything that this world has to offer. Look at the interviews of these rappers, right? Ask them, are they satisfied? Depression, in, 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 the, in the famous world, depression, suicide rates, up, STDs, up. Little girls have to get a Gardasil shot because he's probably gonna get an STD from someone who hasn't slept around in 15 years. Brokenness, emptiness. Look at their interviews. They're saying, guys, I thought when I get all the money, people will be thinking like, oh, man, you're Bow Wow. You have everything, right? There's an interview by Bow Wow. Oh, man, you're Bow Wow. You have everything you have. But he says, guys, this is nothing. I'm really searching for peace. When the Bible says there is no peace for the wicked, peace is found in Christ because even him and everyone here today, sitting here today, were never created for the things of this world. 
People who disregard God and live for their own purposes have no peace because this text says all things were created by Jesus and for Jesus. I'll give you another example. King Solomon. King Solomon, a man who was the wisest and richest man on the planet in his time. Wisest and richest man on the planet in his time. He had everything that this world, this temporary broken world, has to offer us. Okay? And he wrote a book called Ecclesiastes. Now, King Solomon had literal access to the temple of the living God, the Holy of Holies, meaning God's presence dwelt in the midst of the temple. In Psalm chapter 16, it says, in God's presence is the fullness of joy. Full joy, full satisfaction, full purpose can be found in God and in God alone. And King Solomon had access to that. He's the one who had it built, the temple of the Jewish people built. And he had a question that arose in his mind, an evil question that arose in his mind. And he said, what makes man happy? Listen to that. He had the, he had the access of the one who created joy itself in the temple. And to pers he left the answer to his question to pursue the question, what makes man happy? What makes man happy? And he sought for it. And he gets to the end of his life. But well, let me read this from Ecclesiastes. I said in my heart, come now. I will test you with pleasure. He's talking to himself. Come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity, vanity. All is vanity. Meaningless, meaningless. All is meaningless. And he said, I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of trees and fruit trees. I made myself pools from which water from the forests of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks. You guys have any of that? No, this man had it. Great possession of herds and flocks. More than that, I had surpassed anyone who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver, gold, money, and the treasures of kings and providences. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delights of the sons of men, what makes man typically happy, right? What they think would make them satisfied. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And listen to what he says in verse 10. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from him. Whatever I wanted, I got it. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity. And it, he, he calls it a striving after the wind. Have you guys ever chased wind? It's meaningless, right? And he says, so is the pursuit of anything in this broken world. And he gets to the, he gets to the end of his life and he said, the end of the matter is this guys fear God and keep his commandments the end of the matter is this no God he's created us with eternity in our hearts no God fear God and keep his commandments because he had everything that this broken world had to offer and he and you today were not created for the things in this broken world that it has to offer us you were created by Jesus and for Jesus war famine greed lust idolatry all the brokenness in the world all comes from mankind not deciding to live in God's authority and purposes, but pursuing their own. We were made not for this kingdom. That's, that's what attracted me in my testimony. I recognize the brokenness in this world. God was drawing him, me to himself, and I recognize, man, every blunt that I smoke, I need another one. You know, nothing will satisfy me. Why? Why? It was that question that literally drew me to, to himself. C.S. Lewis was an author. I don't agree with everything C.S. Lewis said, but he was an author that once said, if I find in myself in this world that nothing truly satisfies me, my only conclusion is that I was made for another. If I, if I find myself in this world and nothing can satisfy me therein, my only conclusion is that I was made for another. Okay? You were made for Jesus. For Jesus. So he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, 
visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers and authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. That speaks of his preeminence again. He's before all things and in him, all things hold together. So you and all of creation is not just created by Jesus, not just created for Jesus. You are sustained by him today. You are sustained by him today. Meaning the reason, I'll just be frank with you guys. The reason why your lungs are empowered right now is because Jesus, out of his love and mercy, wants them to. The reason why the planets rotate so perfectly around the sun and nobody can explain how everything is in perfect order because they are sustained, created for, and created by Jesus Christ. You know what this means? If Jesus Christ, everything was created for Jesus, by Jesus, and sustained through Jesus, this means the moment Jesus says, done, the moment he says, done, it's over. Like it says in Hebrews 1, all things are held together by the word of his power. And you know what it says in the end of that chapter? When he says done, he's going to roll up the heavens like it was his t-shirt. That's, that's what it says in Hebrews 1. I mean, the moment he says done, he comes back, he rolls up the heavens like a garment, and he judges the world. And he has the right to do that because all things were created by him, for him, and are sustained by him. This son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He has the right to do that because he is the image of the invisible God, the ruler, authority, the preeminent one, the firstborn of all of creation. By him all things were created in heaven, earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers and authorities. The kings that think they run the earth. All the kings that think they run the earth. The moment Jesus Christ says done, it will be done. It will be done. It will end. It will end. Do you see that there's more to this Jesus than some long-haired man arm wrestling the devil? Do you see his authority in these texts? Do you see it? All the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Christ. Christ. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. That means you, you today, to make it personal, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, you were created by, through, for, and are sustained by Jesus. And I'll tell you, I'm going to end here. I'll tell you, that's terrible news for a sinner, okay? For a sinner, that is terrible news. Look up here. For a sinner, that is bad news. That is terrible news for a sinner rebellion against God. And I'll tell you why. Because if your heart is still proud, rebellious, hating God, hostile to God, an enemy of God in your mind through wicked works, anti-Christ, Dead in your trespasses and sins, walking according to the prince of the power of the air. If you still live with that mindset that says, God, I don't want you ruling over my life. I kind of want to define my own good and evil. And for our religious, even religious people today, they'll try to tip God, you know, every now and then to, to clear their conscience. Yeah, I go to church and Bible study. I read my Bible every now and then. Just tip God like he was, a, like he was your waiter or waitress, right? Like tip, tip him, you know? If that's still your heart, if you are not born again today, according to these verses, I'm going to make, it, make the case, your life is a contradiction. Your life is a contradiction to your own purpose and to all of the rest of creation. Do you see how huge this is? Do you see why sin is more than just a bunch of laws, like breaking a bunch of rules, doing what's wrong? That's, it's more than that. It's more than that. You were created by Jesus, for Jesus, are sustained by Jesus, and you're in rebellion against Jesus. It's more than just breaking the Ten Commandments. Honestly, guys, it's more than that. The God of the universe who created all things, when you rebel against him, it's a contradiction. It's a contradiction. You and all that you have was created for Jesus. You and all that you have are held together by Jesus, meaning your lungs right now, the brain that allows you to think right now, to hear the sound of my voice right now, 
created by, for, sustained and held together by Jesus. Every heartbeat in your chest sustained by Jesus. That lump of flesh in your mouth that the rappers people sometimes listen to use to blaspheme his name created by, through, for Jesus and sustained by Jesus. Sustained, held together by the word of his power. And you are the one that uses that which he gave you, all of creation which he gave you. He gave you out of his love and his mercy, his benevolent love towards you. He gave it to you. Right? He, he allows you to use his creation. You are the one who takes his creation and say, God, I don't want you or your rules or your authority in my life. You are not the preeminent one. All things are not created by you. They're sustained by me, and I'm going to act like they do. Listen, that's terrible news. I'm pleading with you. If you're not in Christ today, these texts demand the fear of the Lord in your life. I'm telling you, fear God. Now, let's look at, let's look at verse 20 together. Let's look at verse 20 together. It is a fearful thing to be at war against this God, okay? To be at war against the one you're created by, through, for, and sustained by. The ground beneath you, sustained by Jesus. The sky above you, sustained by Jesus. The, the Bible on your fingertips, sustained by Jesus. All of it. And it's a fearful thing to be at war against that God. You will not win. But, but, verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. For in him the fullness of God, verse 19, was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That blood could still be yours today. If you find yourself a sinner at war against the God you were created for, by, through, and sustained by, that blood, if you repent, like we, like Eric read in Proverbs 1 a few weeks ago, right? How long, O simple ones, will you, will you love your simplicity? How long, O scoffers, will you delight in scoffing? How long, if you turn at my reproof, if you turn at the rebuke, if you come to this Christ, this one who was once for the Christian, once our enemies, could be your friend, your father. And you can have peace with this God you're at war against. But if you're at war against him, I urge you, fear him and run to him for mercy. For mercy today. For mercy. And for the Christian, for the Christian, for the one in Christ, for the one, and I mean real Christian. I don't mean Christian, yeah, if you, somebody asks you, are you a Christian? So yeah, I go to church. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Christian. But for the true follower of Jesus Christ who has been redeemed by him, you cannot forget the verses 13 and 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. That mindset that hates God, he's delivered us from that. We're done with that. He has transferred us from, to, from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, forgiveness of sins. Yes, Christian, you were once at war against that God that I just talked to the sinner you were at war against him too, but now you are redeemed and have peace with him by the blood. Now, by anything you've done, by the blood of his cross, we have peace with God. We were once at war, but now he has reconciled us to himself by the blood of his cross. And he, this Jesus who owns all things, is for the Christian, for the follower of Christ, for him. That's wonderful news. It's fearful to be against him. But wonderful news to be for this Christ. The sky's above you. It's owned by my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Behold your God. That's your God. That's your God, Christian. That's your God who owns all things. All the gods of the nations are idols. But your God, this Jesus made the heavens. When you go out and preach the gospel and share the gospel, that's your God that's sustaining the person you're talking about. Your God. That's your God. Take courage in that. That should stir us up in boldness and say, take courage in that. He is for us. He is on our side. He's no longer our enemy, but our friend. 
Remember, it's the beloved son who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, whether thrones or dominions, rulers and authorities, all things were created by him and through him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. That's the son you have redemption, the forgiveness of sins from. You have redemption by the blood of his cross. That's your God. But I warn you, brothers, look at verse 23. Look at verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. See, this Colossian church, we're going to 